Anyway, welcome to general relativity. Um, actually, relativity. We're going to do a bit of special and mostly general. Um, this is the best possible course anybody could ever teach. So if I mess it up, it's entirely my fault. <laughs> okay, This really is the nicest subject in physics. And uh, uh, every time I think about preparing for the course again, you know, I just continue to be amazed uh, that people figured out this is how nature works. It's just unbelievable. And we're, of course, living 100 years later than this was all figured out. And the fruits of that theory are now just blossoming like crazy. So this is one of them. Uh, let's see, we seem to have lost it. Uh, you see, while he was here, it was fine. Uh, I'll do what he did. Unplug and plug it in again. Doesn't work for me. Let me try again. Did you? Uh, you probably saw it anyway. It's not working. Oh, <laughs> you see, that's the sign of a theorist. <laughs> I can infallibly... Oh, it's working. Yay. Okay. Um, hi. So uh, this happened yesterday. There's the announcement of the second biggest black hole in the Milky Way. Uh, the center of the Milky Way, um, the black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, a way is called Sagittarius A star. It has 4 times 10 to the 8, the mass of the sun, nearly a billion times the mass of the sun. Uh, the second largest one, they are claiming, it's not completely uh, clear that this is correct, but uh, some Japanese researchers are claiming that they have one which is 10 to the 5, the mass of the sun. And um, at the current in the, in the current age, we're, we're seeing discoveries like this all the time. Um, so you, may, you, you will have heard of gravitational waves detected by LIGO. Uh, there's a rumor of a new event, which uh, people say may be a neutron star colliding with a black hole. And if so, that will be extremely interesting because it will tell us a lot about nuclear matter as well as gravity. Um, and uh, there's a very mysterious objects called fast radio bursts you may have also heard about. And uh, people at Perimeter are very much involved in the search for fast radio bursts. These are mysterious signals from most of the way across the universe, which are uh, uh, last less than, uh, last a fraction of a second. And we do not know their origin. And one of them in particular is very exciting because it seems to repeat uh, for reasons we do not understand. So Perimeter is involved in this. We're involved in the CHIME experiment in BC, which is really world-leading and should detect um, hundreds of these uh, per month. Um, and then we're also involved in experiments in South Africa, which uh, which, which uh, perhaps even more powerful. So welcome. <laughs> Um, uh, this is an extremely exciting time for the study of gravity and in particular, in particular general relativity. So I want to uh, let me recommend a few books and then I'll give you a sort of overview. Third book I want to recommend, it's in the library. Uh, all these are in the library. Uh, this one is Gut, Freund, and Ren, and it is called The Road to Relativity. Okay, and it's an entire book about one paper. It's the paper Einstein wrote which laid out general relativity for the first time. Okay, so these are historians of science, and they've gone through, and the paper itself is reproduced here, the manuscript, uh, the handwritten manuscript by Einstein, and uh, there's a page of it, and uh, you, can, you can read about the incredible journey 
it was to discover, to disentangle the laws of uh, general relativity with lots of mistakes and uh, lots of false uh, hopes. And then finally, when the laws appeared, they seemed to Einstein so compelling that really from that moment, he, he and many others had no doubt that this is the way gravity works. In spite of the almost complete absence of any observational evidence. <laughs> okay. So it really is quite unique, um, quite a unique story. Uh, so can we put the screen up? So let me try to put this in a little bit of context. Uh, before relativity, before relativity, we had we had three uh, great areas of physics. We had uh, classical mechanics, elect electricity and magnetism, which became electromagnetism with uh, Maxwell. And then we had uh, thermodynamics. Okay. And everything in the subject of relativity really traces back to this, to electromagnetism. It's more or less the origin of all the ideas of modern physics go right back to Maxwell. That's why I wrote Maxwell's equations down. And we'll see that the way I'll introduce special relativity will be to begin with these equations, <clears throat> because they're really the root of everything. Um, what happened is, in the second half of the 19, uh, 19th century, contradictions arose between these three great areas of physics, and these contradictions were incredibly fruitful. Okay, so these, these two fields were understood to be in contradiction, and that contradiction led to the development of uh, special relativity. Um, <coughs> and of course, classical mechanics, part of it involves Newton's theory of gravity, and that it was the contradiction between Newton's theory of gravity and special relativity that led to general relativity. Okay, so the, these uh, contradictions in physics have always been very, very fruitful because their resolution often leads to entirely new uh, theories. Um, likewise, electromagnetism and thermodynamics were understood to be in contradiction. And what theory did that give rise to? The theory of heat and the theory of light were incompatible. And what, what arose out of that? Quantum mechanics, yeah. So quantum <coughs> mechanics. Okay, that's when Planck introduced the hypothesis that light comes in packets of energy called photons. It was precisely to resolve that contradiction. Um, now, special relativity... And quantum mechanics, as you know, these two together were successfully combined into another field. What is that field called? Quantum field theory. Okay, and that's the basis of the standard model and uh, string theory and our understanding. Well, let's stick to real physics. That's the basis of the standard model and, uh, and the Higgs boson and so on. And uh, very, very successful theory, okay? But there's a big contradiction because nobody has successfully combined these two ideas. 
And uh, for reasons I'll explain during the course, I believe uh, the current epoch is ideal for this purpose. And so I expect there will be a combination of these two ideas, uh, hopefully within, uh, within our lifetimes at least. But we have a lot of clues. We have an understanding now that uh, quantum field theory is simply incompatible with general relativity. We have observations, observational clues from the universe. And they, we have everything we need to make this next step. Okay, so I want to encourage all of you to think of yourselves as the same as Einstein was when he was thinking about relativity. All right, very young person, uh, completely unrecognized, uh, very brave, imaginative, and that's what it will take. In fact, the most important characteristic is not to listen to your elder, <laughs> including me. So um, there were plenty of other people who worked out a lot of the machinery of relativity. You know, Einstein didn't work in a vacuum. There was Poincaré, and there were Lorentz, and there were uh, many, many other brilliant physicists at the time. But it was Einstein who really saw clearly how he needed to jettison classical physics. And he was involved in, of course, both of those resolutions, the invention of quantum mechanics and uh, relativity, both special and general. So, uh, so that's the picture. I believe that today we're in a situation similar to physicists were in at the beginning of the 20th century. And that's the contradiction uh, we have to resolve. OK, so we're going to start this course off by going back to Maxwell and uh, appreciating Maxwell's laws and seeing how they gave rise to relativity. It took quite a long time. OK, so 1860 was Maxwell's laws. Everything in special relativity was already in here. But it took people till 1905, uh, Einstein in particular, to realize that uh, fact. Okay, so you didn't need any more observations. You didn't need any more mathematics, really. Uh, everything was in here. Uh, and these laws, you see, Maxwell didn't invent all these laws. He, he, physics is profoundly conservative. Okay? And the best physicists are um, learn the status quo backwards, <laughs> inside out, and then realize what's wrong with it. Okay, so it's not that they create things from fresh, the whole thing, never. Right? It's, it's a process of evolution and small modifications which make the key difference. So all of these no laws were known before Maxwell. I mean, Benjamin Franklin was, as far as we know, the first person to figure out that there's something called electric charge and it is conserved. And this is, this is the expression of electric charge conservation. Of course, he didn't write it as an equation. But uh, he figured out there is this thing called electric charge, which comes, uh, well, that's what lightning is, when lightning comes down to the Earth. It's electric charge carried from the clouds to the ground. And uh, so he formulated some kind of law that, that electric charge is conserved. And then there was Gauss. Uh, Faraday, Faraday certainly never wrote any equation like this, but he was, he was an experimentalist, probably the most brilliant experimentalist of the 19th century at least. And he figured out that a changing magnetic field creates an electric field. Uh, and that was crucial to Maxwell. In fact, Maxwell corresponded with Faraday. And if you read Maxwell's papers, he says, all I am doing is putting Faraday's intuition into equations. Faraday actually is the person who invented the concept of a field. Faraday believed that empty space was not empty. It is full of fields which carry forces. So Faraday was absolutely crucial, and Maxwell always gave Faraday the credit for these equations. Um, and uh, then there was Ampere, who figured that an electric current uh, would create a magnetic field. 
And so Maxwell's entire contribution was actually to take all these, these four equations and realize they were actually five equations and realize they were inconsistent. <laughs> okay? So Maxwell realized these equations are inconsistent unless you add this term so that a changing electric field also creates a magnetic field. And when he did that, he could show all these equations are mathematically consistent. And furthermore, if I throw away charges and currents, uh, now I have a magnetic field causing an electric field, an electric field causing a magnetic field. Now you can have waves which travel on their own without any source, and that's what light and radio waves are. So, so, uh, so Maxwell's contributions were, first of all, to figure out an inconsistency. To see it, he had to formulate the equations mathematically to fix the inconsistency, and then to realize what the new predictions were of that fixing. And that's a theme which occurs in Einstein's work and so on. And Einstein always regarded Maxwell as the real hero of relativity. And essentially, all that Mike Einstein did was to do what Maxwell had done, but for gravity. Okay, Mac, Ma Einstein knew he had to write down some field equations for gravity. He wanted a field, and he wanted it to be consistent with uh, special relativity. And so... Maxwell was the one who kind of initiated this way of thinking about physics. In fact, in many senses, Maxwell invented partial differential equations. I mean, that's what these are. They didn't really exist before Maxwell. So you had to, so you think about that, it's a pretty big invention <laughs> to, to realize that you can write down equations involving uh, partial derivatives. Okay, so let me uh, say a little more about these equations. Uh, I've said that 5 is charge conservation. Why is that? Well, the electric charge, Q, is integral d3x rho. So that's the definition of rho. Rho is the charge per unit uh, volume. And uh, so rho is a function of t and x. Um, and... Um, it tells you, so if I have some charge, it tells me the spatial density of electric charge, and that can move around. Okay, so this can be a function of time. The charges can move around. The charge in some volume, V, is given by uh, that formula. <clears throat> and so uh, if I calculate the, ch the rate of change of this charge... Okay, so I've integrated over the x, so, but this, the right-hand side depends on t. So I can calculate the ordinary derivative, and that's just equal to the partial derivative of rho of t of x integrated over the volume. And then what we get from equation 5 is that this is minus integral... Um, d3x div j okay and then uh, of course now we can use the divergence theorem which says that this is integral over s of ds dot, dot j So the idea is that there's some current uh, leaving the surface S of the volume. And um, the expression of charge conservation is just that the total charge contained in volume V, the only way the charge can change is if charges leave the volume or enter the volume. And the minus sign is because we define, um, because the this is the... This is the current per unit area. Okay, so if a positive charge leaves the volume, then J dot dS will be positive, and that corresponds to a decrease in the total charge in the volume.
Okay, so now let's, uh, so that's equation five. Let's now look at the other equations and just check that they're consistent. Okay, so first of all, uh, you see this equation we can immediately see implies there are no magnetic charges in the world. If there was a magnetic charge, you'd put something on the right-hand side here, magnetic charge density. In fact, I'm going to put a little label on the row. Let's call it row E, because we're going to have various densities, in particular energy density. And I'm going to... So E is the electric charge Um, and I guess we should have a JE as well. We'll have various uh, current densities as well. So let's look at equations one through four. Um, so equation two tells us there are no magnetic charges. Uh, people keep looking for them. Lots of experiments which have been conducted to look for magnetic charges. So far, they haven't uh, found any. In fact, one of the predictions of grand unified theories was that there should exist magnetic charges. Uh, and it was a big mystery. It's still a big mystery why there aren't any in nature. Probably grand unified theories are wrong. It's the most simple explanation. But, um, but nevertheless, uh, uh, according to grand unified theories, there should be a right-hand side here. Um, and another way of saying it is that we really don't know why there are no magnetic charges in nature. Uh, but let's take equation two and uh, see that it's consistent with three. So two and three, obviously, if I take the divergence of three, I get div b. Now, Partial derivatives commute. It's another one of Maxwell's discoveries. So when I take the divergence of the right-hand side, I'm allowed to pull the divergence through the d by dt. And if b is 0, so the divergence of this should be 0. Now, is the divergence of this 0? What is, what is this? OK, so this is just vector calculus. I'm reminding you. Uh, remember div of a vector is nothing but uh, di ai. Uh, and here I write di is d by dxi. And uh, this I can also write as d by dx, d by dy, d by dz. OK, and here, we, when indices are repeated, we sum over them. OK, so this is d1 a or dx ax. Okay, um, and then the curl is defined is epsilon. So this is some vector. It has three indices. This is epsilon i j k d j a k. Uh, the epsilon symbol is a Levi-Civita symbol. And this is defined so that epsilon 1, 2, 3 equals 1. And uh, epsilon i, j, k is equal to minus 1 to the p, where p equals the number of permutations of, let's say, pairwise permutations to go from i, j, k to 1, 2, 3. OK, so the, way, the reason I define it like this is that this definition will now work in any number of dimensions. In particular, we're going to need a 4 levi civita symbol with four indices when we go to space-time. And again, it's going to be defined so that epsilon 1, 2, 3, 4 is 1. And uh, 
uh, for other values of the indices. It's just the number of permutations. Okay, so just as an exercise, tell me what uh, what's the value of that <laughs> in five dimensions? Is it plus one or minus one? Minus one. How did you get that? Because it's one, two, three, five, four, and then one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, you, you need to do the four across the one, the two, the three, and then the five has got to go through four indices. So there are three and then four permutations. Okay, so um, this epsilon uh, symbol will be useful later. It's also very useful because you can write the determinant of a matrix in terms of uh, epsilon. Uh, and then we have, um, so let's just look at this expression. That's where we started. This is di epsilon ijk djek. All right, but I told you partial derivatives commute, so that means this quantity D I D J E K. This quantity is symmetric under I goes to J. But this is anti symmetric. Okay, and any time you have a symmetric quantity summed with a, or contracted, we call it with an anti symmetric quantity, you have to get zero. Okay, there would just be two terms which cancel. If you, if you exchange the indices, you're going to get uh, cancelling terms. So this is zero. Okay, so, uh, so we've checked that this equation is perfectly consistent with that equation because the divergence of the left and the right-hand side are identical. The divergence of the left-hand side is identically zero. The divergence of the right-hand side is zero by this equation. Um, what about the next two equations? So now we'll see how Maxwell came up with his, why Maxwell came up with the orange term. So let's now look at equation uh, four. So again, um, let's take the divergence of this equation. Obviously, the divergence of the left-hand side is identically zero, just by the same argument we used here. And on the right-hand side, we've got so zero, so we'll take the divergence of four. And uh, the left-hand side is zero, and the right-hand side is uh, mu naught div j e um, plus mu naught epsilon naught d by d t div e. Okay, so you immediately see that without Maxwell's term, uh, I've got something non-zero on the right-hand side, in particular div of j by Franklin's equation is minus mu naught d rho dt. All right, so obviously there's an inconsistency because what it's saying, the, without this term, the equation is saying that I'm not allowed to change the charge density anywhere in space. d rho dt has to be zero, and that's ridiculous. If I have an electric charge, I can move it around, and then the charge density changes. So the only way it's consistent is because you add this term, and then, of course, by equation one, this becomes uh, mu naught. So using one, this becomes mu naught d by dt rho, and that's zero. Okay, so that was Maxwell's argument, why you have to add this extra term. And uh, 
it's, it's very obvious in uh, modern notation. Of course, if you look in Maxwell's paper, it's great fun to look in Maxwell's paper. There are pages and pages of, uh, of equations with all the x, y's, and z's written out because he didn't, uh, he didn't use this compact notation. This compact notation was invented by an engineer, uh, Heaviside, uh, who wanted to do lots of calculations with these equations, and so he had to invent a better equation, but uh, a, a better notation. But Maxwell actually did everything uh, brute force. Um, and not only that, in fact, Maxwell uh, developed his intuition for these equations by thinking of a machine. So if you look in his papers, it's full of pictures of machines. The, the magnetic fields were rotations of vortices which spread in space. And so he had very intuitive and pictorial images to go along with these equations. That's really what guided him, were pictures of what was happening. Uh, but once he had the equations, he also realized he could just throw away all the pictures. Um, Okay, so then uh, uh, the consequence Okay, so this led to this argument. And um, the extra term we sh we'll see is completely essential for relativity. All of relativity comes from this term. Of course, the consequence, as I already said, there are solutions without rho there are interesting solutions even when rho equals j equals zero. Okay, so the way he got to this term was by imagining a rho and a j, but having introduced them and used them to argue for consistency, he then threw them away and now, as I said, you can see how B causes E and E causes B in such a way as you get interesting solutions. So in particular, if we calculate D2E dt squared using equation 4. So let's differentiate this equation with respect to, um, to time. And we're going to set J equals 0. Right, so then all I get is uh, 1 over mu naught epsilon naught curl of dB dt. Again, I'm using the partial derivatives commute. And then we get from equation 3 that that's minus 1 over mu naught epsilon naught curl of curl E. Okay, so now I have to calculate this quantity in vector calculus, the curl of a curl. And to do that, we're going to use, a, so if we write this in components, it's a vector, epsilon i, j, k, d, j, epsilon k, l, m, d, l, e, m. Okay, this part is curl e with component k. This part is the curl of that with component i. And now we use the identity uh, epsilon i, j, k, epsilon k, l, m equals uh, delta i, l, delta k, m minus delta i, m, sorry, delta j, m, delta i, m, delta j, l. Okay, I assume you've seen that. Okay. 
And uh, in general relativity, not too surprisingly, uh, one often needs to use generalizations of this formula, where, for example, even in 3D, you can contract two indices instead of one. That, that formula follows from this very easily. Or if you have four indices here, you get a generalized expression. In, in, in general, this is some kind of uh, determinant which, which comes in. Uh, but anyway, this formula is enough for what we need. And so we see that over here, I get d. So delta um, il will give me a di. Delta jm will give me a dm em. And then I have a minus sign, and delta I M will give me an E I, and del um, delta J L will give me a D L D L. Okay, and so we can see that this now this is nothing but div E, which is zero by one. And this term is nothing but minus del squared of E. Okay, so, uh, and I should have, there's a 1 over mu naught epsilon naught. And so, IE, we, IE, E satisfies. D to D, D to E D T squared uh, equals minus one over mu naught epsilon naught grad squared E. And this is the wave equation. Um, and what is the speed of propagation of the waves? You can read it off that equation just by dimensional analysis. This is a time. This is a length, right? And so to convert a time squared to a length squared, I must multiply the length, I must divide the length squared by a speed squared. And so we can define this to be minus c squared del squared e. Okay, so the speed of propagation C equals 1 over square root mu naught epsilon naught. And so this is what I call the greatest discovery ever made in science. Maxwell knew from measurements made by other people, mostly Faraday, but some other people too, uh, he knew these constants in, in the appropriate units. He wasn't using SI units. But in his appropriate units, he knew epsilon naught. He knew uh, mu naught. And so all he had to do was calculate 1 over square root mu naught epsilon naught. And you see, if I do that, um, I, um, I'm going to... Um, I think I'm missing a factor. <laughs> uh, nine, sorry. There we go. Nine times 10 to the 9. There we are. So uh, if I take 1 over mu naught epsilon naught, I get, um, I get uh, the 4 pi's. Uh, yeah, so let's multiply them. Mu naught epsilon naught multiplied together, the 4 pi's cancel. And so we get mu naught epsilon naught is equal to 1 over 9 times 10 to the 16 in SI units. And so 1 over square root mu naught epsilon naught equals 3 times 10 to the 8. And of course, uh, this is a speed, so it's meters per second. And uh, that's the calculation Maxwell did. And he was astonished that he got the speed of light correct to within about 5% using the known unit, so he, he said that must be the explanation for what light is, okay? 
So I, I think that was just uh, an amazing moment in history that you could do a little bit of uh, vector calculus and explain not only light, of course, but then explain everything, uh, all electromagnetic radiation. So radio waves, x-rays, gamma rays, they're all the same thing. Yeah? Was there any particular reason they chose C for the speed? As the name? Uh, yeah, as like the... That's a good question. Uh, it's probably Latin, is it? Uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing that, isn't it that celeritas is the Latin for speedy? <laughs> That's a total guess. <laughs> okay. I did Latin when I was 15, <laughs> so it's a long time ago. I'm guessing that's the reason, but that's a complete guess. Light is certainly speedy, so I'm guessing C is the name for speed. In, is the first letter of a, it may be Greek or Latin. Um, in fact, it's, it's very entertaining to read Einstein's 19, 1915 paper, which is in that book, because he introduces the notation for the metric, G. And, you know, once it's there, so he had a choice. to so use a big G, a little G, <laughs> and he varied a little bit in the manuscript and finally settled on little G. And then for 100 years, everyone writes little G. So it's, it's really nice to see this, uh, the process of inventing the notation. Um, uh, what yeah. did you have on minus side and your hand side? Uh, yeah, I'm probably wrong. Um, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, yes, you're right, because I had a minus sign here, so it's a plus. Thank you. <clears throat> um, good. So now you have this equation. Uh, let's write down a solution. Now, remember, we don't only have this equation. We must also satisfy div E equals zero and div B equals zero, right? You have to maintain these two. And essentially, these two equations tell you that the light waves are transverse. The electric field it cannot be non-zero in the direction the light wave is moving. It has to be perpendicular, and the same for the magnetic field. And so let's see that uh, explicitly. So I'll just write down a solution. Uh, e equals, so let's put no electric field in the x direction, no electric field in the y direction. We'll put all the electric field in the z direction. Okay? Now this equation, this solution, obviously satisfies div E equals zero, because remember div E is d by dx of Ex plus d by dy of ey, plus d by dz of ez. And all those terms will be zero. But if I'd put this guy here, it wouldn't work, because the d by dx of this would be non-zero. OK, so that's, uh, that's one of the solutions. I could have put it here. I could have put it there, in the z co coordinate or the y coordinate. That's saying that the electric field must be perpendicular to the direction of motion, which is x. Okay, there's a function of x minus ct. That means that, imagine the function peaks at some value of, of its argument. As t runs forward, the peak in x is also going to run forward. Right? So this might be a t equals 0. There's some function of x. And then if this is x, this will be uh, some non-zero, some positive t. The function will peak when x equals c times that positive number. Okay, so that's the motion of the wave packet and uh, travels along at the speed of light. Um, and the magnetic field, we can see from, we, we, also, we, we must also satisfy those equations over there, so we must satisfy db dt is minus curl E, uh, equation 3, right? Uh, these are all of them, in fact. 1, 2, 3, 4. 
must satisfy the EDT equals uh, C squared curl B. So uh, the way to satisfy that, uh, not hard to check, is this. Um, because uh, the BDT here will the B, the T will be zero, then differentiating this guy, I'm going to get minus F prime. This will, the D by DT will introduce a C, which will cancel that term, right? And the curl of E, uh, so curl is going to be in the, uh, I'll just check one component. In the y component, curly y will be the um, z e x minus d x e z, and uh, e x is zero, so d x e z will give us minus f prime uh, x minus c e t. So that's correct, right? D b d t will equal. Uh, at least this component of the BDT equals the same component of curl E. So you can check all the other equations are satisfied. And uh, indeed, this is a traveling wave. We call this wave linearly polarized because the electric field is uh, pointing only in one direction. So that's uh, linear. Uh, if you play around with these equations, it's not hard to construct circularly polarized lights, meaning that the electric field will rotate uh, in a circle, as will the magnetic field. Um, and basically, this equation ensures that the magnetic field and the electric field are always perpendicular to each other. Um, Are there any questions? No? Okay. Now, I told you that this led to relativity. Actually, it's completely immediate. You've predicted a speed. What? How can you predict a speed? According to Galileo, all speeds are relative. Right? There's no such thing as an absolute speed, according to Galileo. Galileo said, you know, Galileo imagined sitting in a, sitting in a ship with a fly buzzing around. And then he said, if the ship was moving, could I tell without looking outside? And the answer, no, because the fly is moving and I'm moving and who cares what's going on? So motion... Galileo's fundamental principle introduced into the laws of motion was that all velocities are relative. So that means there's no such thing as an absolute speed. Because if there's an absolute speed, it means it doesn't change when you, cha when you move. So I send off my light wave and I run after it. It's still the same speed? That's ridiculous. Okay, so as soon as Maxwell realized he could predict the speed of light, all of classical mechanics failed. <laughs> okay. But it took people a long time, 45 years, to realize that. Because they're obviously very reluctant to give up on everything they knew. Okay. But the seed was there. You cannot predict the speed in Galilean or Newtonian mechanics. This is just completely ridiculous to predict an absolute speed which is independent of the observer, okay? So, uh, but that's what happened, okay? Now, um, so that's the first point. Uh, physically, it had to be that this, so an absolute speed, so the existence of an absolute speed 
is incompatible. Galileo and with Newton. Okay, Newton, again, like Faraday and Maxwell, uh, Faraday had the intuition, which Maxwell converted into equations. Galileo had the intuition, which Newton converted in, into equations. But they really... Uh, had the same uh, philosophy. And Galileo's intuition actually came from experiments. I mean, Galileo used to get painted white boards and throw blackened cannonballs up those boards, okay, and watch how they move. And when he did that, he found the mark they made was a perfect parabola. <laughs> And from that, he concluded that the universe works in mathematics, <laughs> which was true. <laughs> it was absolutely true. But uh, he got his intuition from experiments. OK, so um, how, do we, um, how do we go from Maxwell to relativity? And this is. Well, the first point is extremely simple. If you have a speed, you can convert times into distances, right? So instead of x and t, space and time coordinates, you can unify them. In fact, the whole idea of unification really goes back to like, Maxwell. See, what did he do? He unified electricity and magnetism. He also unified, because of the speed, he introduced, he laid the groundwork for unifying space with time into space-time. So we unify these things into CT and X. Okay, so I should always insist that the quantities I'm putting together into one object should have the same dimensions doesn't really make any sense to unify things that have different dimensions. But now I have the speed, I can convert time into distance. And so this is called the, these are called the space-time coordinates. Okay, and so that is x mu. And mu will be 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, so all Greek letters go over four values, 0, 1, 2, or 3. 0 is always the time coordinate. 1, 2, 3 are the space coordinates. And then Latin indices take the values 1, 2, uh, 3. I say Greek is more fundamental. Basically, we think of the Greeks as being a lot more clever than the Romans, <laughs> okay. The Romans were just uh, military, military uh, powers. It's a bit, I, I hate to say this, offline, a bit like the US and Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the one I like is Scotland and, the U and the England, because see, Maxwell was Scottish, and the Scots and the English have the same relationship as the, as the more or less, as the, as the Canadians and the, they should. Canadians need to think that way. Um, okay, so um, we, we can unify space and time into these coordinates. Okay, now this looks like a trivial thing to do, but it's actually very, very profound to put together space and time. And this was the idea of Minkowski. Okay. And he's one of the few people that Einstein acknowledged. <laughs> if you look at his papers, they generally have almost no references. Right? Almost none. I mean, it's not like today. 
today you write a paper and the the day after you put it on the archive you get 10 emails saying oh you didn't refer to me you know they don't read they don't they don't read your paper <laughs> they just look for the references so ridiculous okay so um, but anyway in einstein's time that was not the case and if you look at his paper e equals mc squared right the original paper it's completely amazing three pages beautiful argument i'll give the argument uh, later this week no references Zero. Okay? So that to me is the model of a good physics paper. It doesn't require any references, and nobody should complain. <laughs> Even more important. Okay. So, um, so this was Minkowski's idea to put space and time together in a geometrical picture. And that meant that you, you draw axes. You say, here's time and here's space. I can't draw four dimensions, so tough, I'll just draw two. Um, but I think of the geometry of space and time. That was very, very important, and that's how we, we will think of things. But for the moment, let's just continue doing some algebra. We see that, of course, um, we can also combine d derivatives. d by, uh, and, and let's call it grad. Okay, this is also a single object with the same units. And so we will call this d mu. Now, furthermore, it, you see, you notice what I've done is I've put these indices up and this, this index up and this index down. And it turns out it's very important in, in order to write Maxwell's equations in a manner uh, which leads you to relativity, it's very important to distinguish the up from the down. Down. And in fact, we can convert up to down but by using something called eta. So, uh, yeah, we'll see that we need an eta. Eta mu nu is, is this matrix. And uh, its inverse is eta mu nu, so that eta is delta mu alpha. Okay, so the delta is always defined to be 1 if the indices are the same and 0 otherwise. 1 and so this guy is the inverse of eta. This is ordinary matrix multiplication. And uh, eta mu nu, it's easy to see. The inverse is just the same matrix. OK, and we'll, we'll see why we need to do that in a moment. So, for example, the wave operator, right, we saw the electric field obeys this equation, the wave equation. And so here we have an operator which is d2 dt squared minus um, c squared grad squared, right, d2 dt squared minus c squared grad squared. Well, let me divide by c squared to make everything in uh, spatial uh, units. And so that's the wave operator. And that, obviously, is equal to minus, well, let me put minus sign here and plus there, 
And so then this is equal to eta alpha beta d alpha d beta. OK, so the eta is there simply to put the minus sign uh, in the time uh, direction. OK, so now we want to rewrite the Maxwell equations using uh, this notation, this uh, space-time notation. Now, the first task we face is we're going to have to write E and B into something with Greek indices. Okay, so there are six of these things, electric and magnetic fields. We know they are somehow similar. It would be natural to combine them. How can I combine six objects into objects whose components range over four values. There's only one way to do it, but what is that way? See, this is a symmetric um, four by four matrix, right? X mu is a four component vector, it has four components. Uh, a symmetric four by four matrix has how many components? Symmetric, how many does it have? There's four on the diagonal, right? And then it has six off-diagonal, right? Because the other off-diagonal elements are equal. So it has 10. Symmetric 4x4 four four matrix has 10 independent components. What kind of object has six independent components? Anti-symmetric. Anti-symmetric, OK? So if we take f mu nu to be minus f mu nu, f nu mu, anti-symmetric, four by four. It's not allowed to have any diagonal components, right? Those diagonal elements are all zero because they're equal to minus <coughs> themselves. So the off-diagonal elements, well, they're six. And they, they come in pairs. So this has six uh, components. And so that's how we should combine the E and B. We have to put them into something which has only six uh, components. And so what we do is write them in this matrix, 0, 0, 0. It's anti-symmetric on the diagonal. Here is minus E x over C, minus E y over C, minus E z over C. Have to have the units the same. And you can easily see that, you know, from equation 3 that um, E times C will have the same units as B. We saw that in the solutions as well. So, um, sorry, E over C should have the same units as, uh, yes, E over C should have the same units as B. So, um, this is anti-symmetric, so we have, and now we have to put the Bs in. Well, there are three places to put the Bs in. So let's put them in like this. And that might look a little strange, but um, once you realize this Levi-Civita symbol, this is invariant under rotations. As long as the delta ij, it's also invariant, because as long as the rotations have unit determinant, uh, the epsilon is invariant. And so it makes sense to, to write the B field. Uh, it respects rotational symmetry to write the B field in terms of an uh, anti-symmetric 3 um, three by 3 matrix. And then we have 0i. So this is ie. It's just equivalent to this statement, ie f0i is minus ei over c. Okay, so now we can easily um, raise the two indices. I've, I've written them with lowered indices. Okay, that's the definition of f with lowered indices. If I raise the indices, I do this with the eta. 
Okay? And all this tells me to do is if there's a zero here, I put a minus sign in here. Okay? And if there are two zeros, well, I, know, I can't get two zeros because it's anti-symmetric. So at most, there's one zero, and then I put a minus sign. So that all I do is I flip the sign of the E's. So this is 0, 0, 0, 0, plus EX over C, plus EY over C, plus EZ, C. Nothing happens to the Bs. And then minus the same thing. OK, so that's F with uh, lowered indices and with upper indices. And now let us, um, yeah, I'll just continue here, actually, since we're nearly finished. Let's define, what about this, what about the charge density and the current? Can I combine those into something with four indices? What's the obvious thing to do? Have a, char have a, a scalar quantity, the charge density, doesn't change under rotations, doesn't have any indices. And then I have a vector. So obviously, you have to put them together. We have to make sure the units are correct. And so we'll define it to be rho EC times J. Why are the units the same? This is a current per unit area per unit time. OK, this is a, this is, sorry, charge per unit area per unit time. This is charge per unit volume. If I multiply volume by length over time, I get charge per area per time. So these are the same units. And uh, because we call this a current density, I prefer to leave the current to have the same, you know, no factor of C. So this always has the units of a current, electric current. Um, and then the Maxwell equations. Are, are just uh, d alpha f alpha beta equals minus mu naught j beta and uh, d alpha f beta gamma plus d beta f gamma alpha plus d gamma f alpha beta equals zero. <laughs> OK, so I leave it to you to check that that's true. Yeah. Why don't the signs on the magnetic field flip in that? Why not what? Why don't the signs on the magnetic field flip? Oh, this guy, remember the eta is minus 1, 1, 1, 1. So that means that if I take a space index here, so let's just write this out. This is eta. You see, uh, this is alpha 0, eta alpha 0, f 0, 0, plus eta alpha i, eta alpha 0, f i 0, plus dot, 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 right? So I've got a sum over all the values. We've got a sum over 0 and i. Now, when I sum over the i's, I get the magnetic fields. But then these are necessarily delta ij. They're necessarily just one. There are no minus signs associated with the spatial directions. The only way you get the minus sign is if one of these was a 0. Then I get an eta 0, 0, which gives me a minus sign. So I never get any minus signs for the magnetic fields, only for the electric fields. That's the whole role of eta. It's to introduce minus signs in the right place. Because the wave operator has a minus sign in front of t, okay, at the dt squared term. So that's the first clue that you, time is different than space. Okay, in fact, the only difference between time and space is that minus sign. This is the only difference between time and space. Oops.
in special relativity. Okay, so I will leave you to check. You see, roughly, so what's going to happen is that obviously this equation is going to lead to 1 and 4. Those are the two equations with chart 1 has rho e, 4 has j e. So uh, the zero component of this equation will be Gauss's law. The i component of this will be um, Ampere's law. Okay, and so you must check that this thing reproduces the curl B with the one over C squared D E D T. And over here, these these obviously reproduce equations two and three. Okay, so the person to realize this was uh, Lorentz. Lorentz realized that you could write uh, Maxwell's equations. There's only two equations. See, over there, there how many equations are there? there? The first two are really two, but the next are really six, right? Because they're vector equations. So each of these has three components. So there are eight, eight three here, three here, and two. So there are eight equations. And then this one, of course, is implied by the other eight. This, this one is a consequence of the other equation of the other equation. So there are really eight uh, equations here. And over there we've got um, eight equations because the first line is four equations and the second line is four equations. Okay, so I think we should stop there. Are there any questions? Just to let you know, I think... Um, Wednesday and Thursday, you're going to have more than you want of me <laughs> because the quantum lecturer is away for those days. So I will double teach on Wednesday and Thursday, and then on Friday and Monday, you'll have the right amount of me, which is zero, and then I'll be back on the Tuesday. So any, any, more, uh, any more questions or Is there a class this afternoon? Yes, there is a class actually. The class will focus on how to prove, well, not prove, how to, this, how to realize that the E and the V should be combined to the anti symmetric tensor. Because okay. somebody would think maybe you can just add a random stuff, promote a three vector to a four vector. I see. But the, this tutorial will tell us that that's just not the right to prove, okay. not the right thing to do. There's only one way to do it. Right. Yeah, in general, I, I won't prove that things are unique in the lectures, but uh, uh, many of the things we will discuss actually are unique, and people have tried for 100 years to change these things, and uh, uh, it's quite difficult. There's a, there's a logic in... I mean, by the way, it's also worth mentioning that in Maxwell's theory, you know, how many free parameters are there? If we just take Maxwell, okay, let's imagine the charge part of it is provided by someone else. Okay, just take the E and B. How many free parameters in this theory? Are there any parameters in the theory? In, in the equations, for, oh, well, look at those equations, all right? So imagine somebody just gives you the J. Somebody gave you the J, all right? How many extra equations are there? How many extra parameters are there? Zero. Aren't any parameters in Maxwell's theory? <laughs> okay. Now let's compare how well we're doing today. How many parameters are there in a typical theory people postulate today? Let's maybe start with string theory. <laughs> how many free parameters? Actually, nobody knows how to count because they're probably infinite. They're actually not, yeah, I mean, uh, uncountably complicated. So I think it's very good for us always to measure ourselves 
according to what really worked in history. And I think on that measure, we have to say we're doing really, really badly. Okay? Uh, and that, should ins that shouldn't, ins shouldn't make us give up. It should be the opposite. It should say, look, when you really understand nature, it's very simple. The confusion and the complexity in our theories is the result of our not understanding. <laughs> okay? So, uh, yeah, Maxwell's theory has no free parameters. Uh, Einstein's theory of gravity uh, has one, well, in, in, in a sense, you could say there is one, because you could say there's a unit of electric charge. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, but uh, in Newton's theory of gravity, there was one free parameter. Right? Newton's constant, Newton's gravitational constant. The miracle of Einstein is he introduced no more parameters, nothing more than Newton had. Right? So he took Maxwell, took Newton, combined the theories, got general relativity, no new parameter, except one. But uh, that, that's the dark energy. But that's a small correction, <laughs> which has the seeds of uh, the next revolution in physics. Yes. So what do you mean by free parameters? Is mm. Newton's not, not a free parameter? Um, yeah, you could call that a free parameter. I mean, um, in general, what you, it's, you know, it's a good question. In principle, what you mean by free parameter is a dimensionless quantity, right? Which no change of units will affect. So if you have some constants, but they depend on which units you use, you can't really say they are a fundamental free parameter you just pick units in which it's one. But if you have a quantity which has no units, then there is nothing you can do to change its value. And that you could honestly call a free parameter. So uh, the simplest example in Maxwell's theory, but it actually relies on quantum mechanics coming in, is the fine structure constant, 1 over 137. That's a genuine free parameter in the quantum version of Maxwell coupled to charges. Um, so otherwise, you, you would always be suspicious that it's just a matter of units. But the fine structure constant has no units, so it's really a parameter and has a value, 100, well, 137 in any units. So it's, it's a little bit of a subtle question. But the mu naught, you know, mu naught is this value in SI units, but in some other units, it would be 1. So I couldn't really call it a free parameter. Does big G have units? Big G has units, exactly. So, um, so you can uh, talk about... <clears throat> so big G has units, but you can uh, combine big G with, uh, again, with H bar and C, and this gives you the Planck mass. This, again, has units because it's a mass. Okay, but then you can take the, uh, let's say, the mass of the proton, M Planck, and then you can take the mass of the proton, which is a mass, and you can consider M Planck over the mass of the proton, and that's a dimensionless. And so that, you would say, is a free parameter. In Einstein gravity, coupled to standard particle physics, I'm free to dial the Planck mass relative to the proton mass. That's a free parameter. Okay. So there are a number of free parameters in the standard model of gravity plus particle physics. The total number, I believe, is 21. Uh, of course, there are actually more now because neutrinos have been measured to have a mass. And in the neutrino mass matrix, there's another eight or nine. So of order 30 in the physics that we know. Um, but in uh, general relativity per se and electromagnetism per se, they really aren't, they never introduced any new free parameters. Just completely remarkable. So we should aspire to that. I mean, we should aspire to theories which explain the values of these parameters and which do not introduce many, many more. And so far we are failing miserably to do that. Okay, so I think you need a break. Have a break, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow.